Good morning. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
I'd like to welcome you to the First Presbyterian Church of Leclerc this morning. It's always nice to see familiar faces out there. And we'd love to see some faces that aren't so familiar. So those of you who might be watching us with our live stream this morning, please uh, join us every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to uh, have you here. We're a friendly church and we're very welcoming and uh, love to meet people. This is September 5th. 2021, and this is the 15th Sunday after Pentecost. Today we're going to talk a little bit and look at the book of James, chapter 2, which talks about faith and faithfulness, and not just talking the talk, but walking the walk as well. So, uh, as always, this is a wonderful day for us to celebrate, a wonderful day uh, for us to worship our Lord and Savior, um, who gave his only Son for us, so that our sins would be forgiven. And we died on the cross, and so that we have a life in heaven eternally at their side. Hope you had a great week, and hope that the coming week will be a spiritual one for all of you. A um, few announcements. Next Sunday, September 12th, Reverend Philip Leopold will be joining us. He'll be in the pulpit. We always have our chair aerobics on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. That's still going on, correct? We have men's group every Saturday morning at 7.30. Uh, September 8th is coming Wednesday. is Wednesday night program kickoff starting at 5.30. We have friends group on September 11th in the fellowship hall starting at 7. And then September 14th, there's a congregational care meeting at 9. Are there any other announcements for the good of the whole? Diane. This isn't so much an announcement as it is begging, pleading, asking. We'd be most appreciative with the Wednesday night program if we could get a few of the men to come and be a presence during the uh, gathering. We all feel like it's important for the kids to see men involved with the youth. And we also could use your help and support. So we hope you'll all consider giving a night now and then to help us out. So thank you in advance. <coughs> Thanks, Diane. I'll talk to you after church. Any other announcements? How's Nolan doing? Good. I tried to talk him into coming today because he stayed with me, but he gets real embarrassed when people ask him about it, but he's oh, feeling yeah. very well. Matter of fact, he's back to school. Excellent. Good news. Anything else? No. No. Willow. Willow had her hand up. All right. Okay, if there are no other announcements, let us bow our heads in prayer for our grief-stricken friends in Haiti. God of compassion, hear us as we pray in sorrow for the people of Haiti and the lives lost and communities shattered by the devastating earthquake in its aftermath. These island neighbors still not wholly restored from a cat the catastrophic earthquake of 2010 continue to struggle to move forward under increasingly heavy burdens of poverty and chronic hunger, civic unrest, hurricanes and COVID-19. They need the oneness of our purpose and the tangible outpouring of our love, our prayer of action. As your servant Elijah fled for his life into the wilderness and found bread for the journey, may survivors of this disaster find in the outpouring of their neighbor's care, shelter, sustenance, and compassion in the midst of horrors, in the sheer silence that follows, let us have an, an answer when your voice inquires. What are you doing here, Elijah? Let us answer with our prayers. Let us answer with generous gifts. Let us join together in an international community of healing to rebuild, to restore, and in time to rejoice. Then in a world that suffers, light still shines, and darkness and dust shall not overcome. In the name of the human one, we pray. Amen.
And now let us take a moment of silence to prepare our hearts and minds and souls for worship. We lift up our praise to you, O Lord. sinners and will die sinners 
but by the grace of our Heavenly Father who gave His only Son to die on the cross for our sins, we know that there is a room in our Father's house, an eternal room for us to go to. So please join me in our call of confession. confession. Gracious God, we come before you today knowing that we often fall short of your call to love one another well. We allow ourselves to be blinded by fear, doubt, wealth, and power. We ignore those around us who suffer injustice, poverty, and rejection. We tune out the cries of the poor and those on the edges of our community. Hear now our silent confession. Help us to see your great generosity. Hear your word of mercy and feel your great love for all who need your redemptive grace. Strengthen us to reach out in service to those who are in need. Make us aware of we exclude so that our minds are opened and we may see them as your precious children. Help us to serve in humility and joy. May we continue to grow in grace as we learn how to serve you in the name of the greatest servant, Jesus. Amen. And again, as we know, we are sinners. The, the beauty is that we will be forgiven. We are forgiven. And there is life after this earth. So we are assured of pardon. With Jesus' life and death, we were bought with his sacrifice. In him we have received the Holy Spirit that is from God. Rejoice in and through Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. God. Christ is a Prince of Peace. In Him we are reconciled to God and to one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Also with you. Let us share the peace of our Lord Christ with one another. Hopefully one of these days we'll be able to get out and mingle and give hugs and handshakes. Please be seated. It's time for our children's moment. How are you guys today? Good. Did you do anything exciting yesterday? No? Didn't do anything exciting? What did you do? Did you play? Did you go outside and play? It was kind of a cloudy day, wasn't it? No. Yeah. Does anybody know what tomorrow is? Do you have to go to school tomorrow? You don't, you don't have to go to school tomorrow. What's tomorrow? How about somebody from the congregation? Can you help us out? What's tomorrow? Labor Day. Labor Day. And you get tomorrow off. You do. And Labor Day is a celebration of all of the hard work and working people that work every day in this country to put bread on the table, 
take care of their families, right? So that you can have a roof over your heads and you can have an education. And so it's a celebration of all of that hard work. And one of these days, when you guys get bigger, you're gonna get to go to work too. And work is a good thing. You know, does anybody know how many days it took God to create the world? How about congregation? How many days? Six. Took six, but the seventh day he rested. And that's the Sabbath, and that's Sunday. So we rest on Sunday. But he worked really, really, really hard for six days to create this world. And God thinks that work is a good thing. And so when you get older and you go to work, you're going to get paid. Part of that is going to go in taxes. And I'm looking out here and I'm seeing a lot of frowns on faces of the older folks. But those taxes do a good thing for us as well. They pay for the education that you guys get. And they pay for people who may have had been down on, down on their luck and, and need some food. So taxes aren't all that bad either. So remember, Labor Day is a good thing. God thinks it's a good thing. He works six days, rest of the seventh. Make sure you take Sabbath off and rest. All right? So let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for working people. Thank you for giving us a day of rest. So we can remain strong and healthy. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now you can go off to kindergarten or to the nursery if you want to, all right? Please join me in the prayer of illumination. O Lord God, you call us to pay attention to those around us, to do more than simply give to the worthy causes, to listen to your holy word, to pray and to do. Help us to live out our faith and our understanding of your word with compassion for others. Amen. Please join me in the responsive reading of Old Testament, Psalm 125, 1 through 5. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so, so the Lord surrounds his people, and from this time forth and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hand as to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good. Those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 through 37. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syriophician origin. Try and say that word twice. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sid Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Decapolis. They brought him, they brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. 
He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Epitaph, that is the opening. And immediately his ears were opened and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Our New Testament reading this morning is from the book of James. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and verses 14 through 17. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it, is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blasphemy the excellence name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law, but fails in one point, has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say that you have faith, but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the story goes that a man dies to meet St. Peter at the early gates. Peter says to the man, Here's how it works. You need to have 100 points to get into heaven. You tell me about all the good things you've done. They are all worth a certain number of points. If your total is 100 or more, you can come in. Well, says the man, I was happily married to the same woman for 52 years. I never looked at another woman. I was attentive and loved her dearly. That's great, says St. Peter. That'll be two points. Hmm, says the man, this is going to be harder than I thought. Well, I attended church regularly, volunteered my time, and tithed faithfully. Wonderful, says St. Peter. That's worth another point. One point, says the man. Okay, all right. I was involved with a prison ministry for 25 years. I went to prison at least monthly and shared Jesus with them all. Wow, says St. Peter, that's another two points. Only two points, says the man. At this rate, it'll only be by the grace of God that I'll ever get into this place. Bingo, says St. Peter, that's 100 points, come on in. So during your life, have you ever had and acted on beliefs that today you know are not true? Like coffee will stunt your growth, or eating too much candy will give you diabetes. Or playing with toes will give you warts. Or one of my favorites, if you cross your eyes too much, they will stay that way forever. Of course, all of these beliefs were wrong. We as Christians believe something different than others in the world around us. But this time, what we believe is actually right. 
The thing is that those around us won't understand what our actions are all about if they don't believe the same things as us. Our actions will look like foolishness to the world around us. So let's put faith to work. The book of James has an important message for us. It tells us that it is not enough to say that you believe something. You have to act out your beliefs. Later on in chapter two, after what we read this morning, we are told that faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. This is a pretty harsh statement. James goes on though. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. James makes a good point. Accepting a group of facts as true in the back of your mind is not an event of salvation. But so often, this is precisely what we are told our faith really is. We accept that we are saved by believing in Jesus. But what does this truly mean? There is a lot of different language in our Christian faith as well as in the Bible that helps us to understand a bit better what it is that this means. A common definition in the Christian church for believing is in Jesus is accepting Jesus as your personal savior. I remember first buying into this definition uh, when I was in high school. It has its value, but it can also be dangerous a dangerous way to define our faith. The value is obvious. By seeing that Jesus is our personal Savior, we realize that God wants relationship with each of us individually. You aren't saved because your parents were saved. You aren't saved because you go to church. You're saved because you have a personal relationship with God. Also in high school, a distinction was made in some of the readings I did, saying that a relationship with Jesus is personal, not private. I think this touches on the dangers of this language. We often want to think that our relationship with Jesus is a private one. It's just me and God and that's it. But that is definitely not the way God works. Throughout the Bible, God is constantly working with groups of people and he calls for us to come together as a group of individuals to worship him. He honors it when groups come together in his name. He says that that is the place where he is present. The other danger with a personal Jesus is that the idea that comes from this language that Jesus is a possession. But the Bible has different language to describe what it means to believe in Jesus. It tells us that we need to proclaim in that Jesus is the Son of God. This is actually a requirement for leaders in the church. If you don't acknowledge the Je Jesus divinity, you are a false prophet. If you don't admit that Jesus is God, then your message isn't a Christian one. The Bible also spends a lot of time talking about faith. I love this word because in the original Greek, the word has two different meanings. It means to have faith, which is to believe in something. But it also means to be faithful, which means to stay true to something. So every time the Bible tells us to have faith in God, it is telling us to trust God. But it is also telling us to be faithful to God. And so believing in Jesus is more than just something you do in your head. Having faith means being faithful as well. This is what is described in the scripture. This is the way our faith is to work. If you believe something, you'd better live in a way that is congruent with what you believe. If you believe that there is more than just this world, your life should be lived with a coming world in mind. If you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, then you no longer live in fear of death. If you believe that Jesus calls for us to follow his commandments, then you better not be lying, cheating, murdering, stealing, coveting. Well, you get the picture. And if you truly believe what is written in our own Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, then you better treat people equally. Do we believe that God has and place favorites? I don't think so. 
James talks especially strong about this last one. Listen to what he has to say. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? James is telling us to act in a way that is contrary to the way this world works. He is telling us to treat the poor in the same way that we treat the rich. Show them the same respect. Treat them with the same honor. This just may look like foolishness to the world around us. It may not make sense. In this world, we are taught the importance of treating the powerful with difference. We are expected to suck up to those who are in authority over us. The wealthy have earned special treatment and deserve it. This is something that we don't always see spelled out so very clearly, but it is something, but it is obvious when you look closely for it. We still live in a world where class matters and where prejudice reigns. We look at those around us who are not well off as we are, and we tell ourselves that they deserve to, deserve to be where they are because of their lack of work or resourcefulness. Or we look at those who are really wealthy and attack them for taking advantage of those around them to get where they are. But then we read today's scripture and we realize that God does truly believe in equality of all people. Now, in James, this is presented by distinguishing between the rich and the poor. But, it is clear throughout the scripture that God has more than just this distinction in mind. All people from all backgrounds and all places are looked upon by God with love. And God even has a special place in his heart for those who are weak and poor. In truth, at least half of the Old Testament prophets are written about this very issue. You see, God wants us as his people to treat all people equally. He wants us to reach out to the poor in the same way we do to those who are well off. And this doesn't mean just to accept them in your worship service either. It means that we are called to help those who need it. But we, as God's people, aren't always good at this. And it seems that we haven't been good at this throughout history. But that doesn't get us off the hook. God has chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who loved him. How can we treat the poor badly? These are the very ones that God loves. We are called to reach out with that same love towards them. But again, I think that this has more to it than just reaching out in love to the poor. I think it is God reminding us that he has created all people equally. That, is that something that you really believe? Is it something that we give lip service to, but it's not necessarily something that we all live out? You see, we all seem to believe that we are better than others. We think that we are better than people of different races, perhaps, or that we're civilized or more righteous. If not other races, we are definitely better than people who are not Christians. We have believed in Christ and these other people have not, so that makes us better people, right? Wrong. In fact, in some ways, I believe it makes us worse. You see, Paul tells us that even our faith is a gift from God so that we have no reason to boast. And we are also told that as Christians, we are promising to be faithful to God. We accept God's word as law, and yet we choose not to follow it. How can we possibly think we are better than those who don't believe they should be following the rules? So don't let yourself be filled with the sin of pride. Instead, realize that if anything, you are luckier, more blessed than unbelievers because you have been shown God's grace. And hopefully accepting this, you will reach out to those around you with the same love 
and that same grace. God wants us to get past our own prejudices and preconceptions about those around us. Instead, he calls for us to radiate his love to this world around us that needs to see it. James refers to this as the royal law. Jesus calls it as the second half of the great commandment. It is the center of what it means to be faithful to God. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is what we are called to do as Christians. This is what we are called to be. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you reached down and took a handful of dirt and created us. You created us from your image and you created us all to be equal. To be equal and not for one person to be superior or better than another. You created us to ask us to look out for one another, to look out for the animals of this world, to look out for the plants of this world, to look out for the streams, rivers, lakes, and oceans of this world. You created us all to be equal. And you asked us to be faithful to you and your son. But to be faithful without action is a faith that is dead. Father, help us all to put our faith into action each and every day to do your will and your work. Let us never just talk the talk, but let us walk the walk. Those who trust in God are like the mountains. God shelters the people. Rich or poor, God creates us to pursue justice. God calls us to be rich in faith. We are blessed when we share our blessings. Thank you.
join me as we say what we believe by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is time that we normally would be passing our offering plates, but um, as you know, we're not doing that yet. So if you would please leave your offering at the, uh, the plates as you come in or leave the sanctuary this morning, that would be most appreciative. Please join me. We have been richly blessed, are called to share that blessing with the world, give freely in the joy of serving your neighbor and your God. God of mercy, the earth groans as wildfires rage, hurricanes destroy, and our climate continues to warm and change. We are weary of disaster, God. We are tense from concern and fear. We feel helpless as we watch each evening's news. Hear us, O oh God, as we share ourselves, our prayers, our hopes with you. Bless us, O oh God, with a reverent sense of your presence as we lift these petition, petitions to you, we pray for students newly returned to school. We pray for their curiosity, imagination, and intellect to bloom. We pray that they persevere through every new challenge, that they take advantage of their education, that they work hard to develop their emerging skills. We pray also for parents and teachers, still navigating the change and pressures brought on by the pandemic. Bless these, we pray, with your wisdom and grace. We pray for our nation and our nation's leaders. In this time of national turmoil, come near, holy God, to both judge and save. When we turn from your way, help us repent and return. May our leaders be led by your wisdom. May they clearly discern your will and seek to follow it. We pray also for those who serve our nation through the military. Keep those, these sons and daughters safe. Keep them from being hardened by war. Restore them from moral injury. Heal them from physical, mental, and spiritual pain. We pray for the suffering all across our globe. We pray for peace to reign in Afghanistan, for the Afghan people to enjoy the freedom and dignity they deserve. We pray for mercy for the people of Haiti, for respite from their endless woes for prosperity for a country desperate to make their way. We pray for all those who must endure violence, destruction, and abuse. Pray today and every day for our members and friends in nursing homes, all veterans, servicemen and women, and their families, all who have been sentenced to life without parole, all fire, law enforcement, and EMS personnel, June L., Pat and Jim Collins, Jesse Borton, Donna Luckman, Tom Bloomingdale, 
Skip Sue, Janet Kirk Barkdahl, Nolan Calkins, L.C. Chamberlain, Wes and Joyce Keel, Paul Gillespie, Paul and Diane's son John, Bryce Bowie, Ken Stinson, Betty's daughter Amy, Wes and Joyce's, da Joyce's daughter Anna, Marilyn's daughter Candy, Janet Kirk's daughter Amber, Chris and Pauline's Aunt Joan, Glenda and Kirk's daughter Paula, Mission Starfish Haiti. Save us, God, from sectarian thinking that leads us to believe others' problems are not our own. Remind us of our interconnectedness, that the suffering of some is the suffering of us all. Mighty and merciful God, we praise you for sending healing and hope through doctors and nurses and researchers who bless us with the new science and technology to serve and save. We claim your promise of wholesome, wholeness for all who suffer. We glorify you for your constant presence, help, and hope. May your world and all who live in it be renewed through the power of the risen Christ and those committed to being Christ's hands and feet in a hurting world. United as a family of faith and as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers up to you, God our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Finally, hear us pray the prayer of Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed thy be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. That's where I always sit. You took my place. The visitor was even more troubled by the statement, but still he said nothing. Later, as the congregation was praying for Christ to dwell among them, the visitor stood up. His appearance began to change. Horrible scars became visible on his hands and on his skin, his sandal feet. Someone from the congregation noticed him and called out, What happened to you? The visitor replied, as his hat became a crown of thorns and a tear fell from his eye, I took your place. Let us help to never forget and to remind us every day who took our place. 
And every day, let us try to remind those around us. And maybe the reminder of who took our place will spread throughout the world. Your charge this week is to go out and put your faith into action. To not only talk about your faith in relationship with our Lord and Savior, but to practice your faith. The things that you do and to share that with those around you. Now may the peace, joy, and love of Jesus Christ be with you. Be with your family and friends and those who have no family and friends. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.